بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل يا أهل الكتاب تعالوا إلى كلمة سواء بيننا وبينكم ألا نعبد إلا الله ولا نشرك به شيئا ألا نعبد إلا الله ولا نشرك به شيئا ولا يتخذ بعضنا بعضا أربابا من دون الله ربنا الله ربنا الله ربنا الله ربنا الله ربنا الله ربنا الله ليس غير الله رب العباد أمة الصحراء يا شعب الخلود من سواكم حل أو لا للورى أي داع قبلكم في ذا الوجود صح لا كسرى هنا لقيصرى ربنا الله The concept of shirk originates in the Quran The Quran is the first authority We refer to in order to understand whether Trinity is shirk or not All people of the scripture do not exceed the limits in your religion يا أهل الكتاب لا تعبدوا في دينكم. Do not exceed limits. No say of God but the truth. Hear what is said. Lord, our Lord is one Lord. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your Bible I'm quoting, and this is addressed to the Christians in particular. Jews worship Father alone. Book of John, chapter eight, verse fifty-four, where Jesus acknowledged that divinity. That he said to the Jews that this is the Father. Whom you say is God. Jerry Kelly has to say that Constantine and inserted a passage within the Creed of Nicaea which these Christians follow today. A pagan emperor. <laughs> ونسيتم في ظلام الحادثة قيمة الصحراء في العيش الرغيب this debate is part of the Great Debate Series, which is designed to give both Christians and Muslims a chance to present their positions on various Islamic and Christian topics. The question before us this evening is this. Does belief in the Trinity necessitate shirk? For the Muslim position, we have Adnan Rashid. Now, we'd like to welcome Musa, Adnan's son, to say a few words. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala khatimun anbiya wa sayyidun mursaleen. Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in amma ba'a. My father's name is Adnan Rashid. He is a Muslim preacher and he has debated many Christian clergy in the past on diverse topics. He is presently studying history at the University of London and he is presently serving as a khatib for Haro Muslim Youth Association. He has appeared on a number of radio channels defending Islam, including Premier, radio, Premier Christian Radio. And he is also an active member of, a, of an Islamic think tank called Hintia Institute. I hope you will enjoy this debate and I hope it will benefit you. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you, Musa. For the Christian position, I would like to welcome Dr. James White. James White is director of Alpha and Omega Ministries, and their website is www.aomin.org. 
He's a, which is a, a Christian apologetics organization based in Phoenix, Arizona, in the U.S. He is author of more than 20 books, a professor and an elder of the Phoenix Reformed Baptist Church. James has been married to Kelly for more than 25 years and has two children. He is an accomplished debater, having engaged in more than 60 moderated public debates with the leading proponents of Roman Catholicism, Islam, Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormonism. Now to the, the, the structure of the debate. Each speaker will be given 30 minutes for an opening statement, followed by a 15-minute rebuttal. There will then be 30 minutes for questions and answers from the floor. This should be followed by five minutes, five minute concluding statement by each speaker. And just to warn you, there will be a 10 minute break for changing tapes after the first 30 minutes and I'll, I'll announce that as it happens. So let us now move on to the debate itself. Does belief in the Trinity necessitate shirk? And our first speaker will be Adnan Rashid. Salam alaikum. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In alhamdulillah, nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'afiru. Wa na'udhu billahi min shuroori al-fustina. Wa min sayyiraati a'amalina. Man yahdihi allahu fala mudillala. Wa man yudrilu fala adhiyala. Wa ash'adu an la ilaha illallahu wahdahu la sharika lah. Wa ash'adu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluh. Wa ash'adu anna isa rasulullah. وعبد الله وكلمته والروح منه أما بعد فإن خير الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدع وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة النار Ladies and gentlemen Friends and elders, I greet you with Islamic greeting. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. The topic today is an interesting one indeed. Does belief in Trinity necessitate shirk? We would like to define shirk for you first of all. But before I define shirk, I would like to quote a verse for you from the Quran. Chapter number 3, verse number 64 of Quran. Say, O Muhammad, O people of the scripture, come to a word that is just between us and you, that we worship none but Allah. Allah is a deity whom Jews and Christians identify as God the Father in the Bible. Let's make this clear in the beginning. Allah is the deity who the Jews and the Christians identify as God the Father. And I'll come to substantiate in due course why I say that. And that we associate no partners with Him. And that none of us shall take other as Lord beside Allah. Then if they turn away, say, bear witness that we are Muslims, literally that we submit to, to the will of God as Jesus did. Quran chapter 41 verse number 53 We shall show them our signs in the horizons and in themselves till it is clear to them that is the truth. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 verse number 33 For God is not the author of confusion but of peace. So God is not the author of confusion ladies and gentlemen. Definition of shirk. James White, in one of his previous debates, Professor James White, and I'm privileged to have a debate with a scholar like Dr. James White. I definitely have respect for his credentials. He, in one of his previous debates, mentioned Lane's lexicon, Albert William Lane, an Orientalist who was alive in the mid-19th century. He made a lexicon 
which is to till, to till, which is till this day is the standard work on Arabic as a dictionary. When I went to Lane's lexicon to check the definition of shirk, and I printed the pages for you to look, look at. Lane's lexicon deals with the word shirk in three pages. And the green spots you can see on these three pages are the word share, share, share. So literally, the word share linguistically means to share, to be a partner, to be a co-equal. So, congratulations, Dr. White. Trinity is linguistically shared. Because in your article, a brief definition of Trinity on your website, Alpha and Omega Ministries, you use the word shared twice. This is one being of God. This is one being of God is shared by three co-equal. Shared by three co-equal. Then in the second page, infinite being of God, shared fully and completely by three persons. Shared. So, Albert Lane's Lane's lexicon states, shirk literally means to share. So, linguistically, Dr. James White, I've already proven that the Trinity definitely necessitates shirk. However, our concern today is not the linguistic meaning of shirk. Our concern today is the technical meaning of shirk. What is shirk? Oh, Trinity, whether it is shirk or not, technically. So we will go to Quran first of all because the term shirk or the concept of shirk actually originates within the Quran. Quran explains shirk to be a concept in which when you ascribe partners with God Almighty, who is God, who is Allah, I've already said God is the being which is identified by the Jews and Christians in the Bible as God the Father. So if you ascribe partners with God the Father, that is shirk. It is not polytheism. Polytheism means number of gods, holy number, theism gods, number of gods. Shirk, however, doesn't mean polytheism. Shirk has a different meaning. You can be a monotheist and be a, shirk, uh, be a wish at the same time. Someone who commits shirk. For example, the Quran gives us the definition. In Surah Shura, verse number 21, God Almighty states, A'udhu billahi minash shaitan rajeem, Amdahum shurakaahu shara'u lahum min ad-deen, Ma'alam ya'tam bihillah. Have you ascribed partners to God Almighty, who constitute a religion for you? So you can be a believer in one God, and if you legislate other than Him, or if you concoct a legislation, on top of his legislation, then you become a mushrik, even though you believe in one God. So you can be a monotheist and be a mushrik at the same time. But Trinity is the worst form of shirk, ladies and gentlemen. And I will substantiate that in due course. So shirk is ascribing partners in any form to God Almighty. In his attributes, in his qualities, in his capacity, not only in worship, not in worship alone. Shirk means any type of ascribing partners with God Almighty, who is again God the Father. And I will prove that to you tonight, that God the Father is the only true God. In chapter 17, verse 23, the Quran tells us, and your Lord has decreed that you worship none but Him, and that you be dutiful to your parents. Worship none other, but God Almighty, Allah. Then in chapter 4, verse number, number 36, worship Allah and join none with Him in worship. Join none with Him in worship. Then in chapter 4, verse 48, verily Allah forgives not that partners should be set up with Him, but He forgives except that anything else to whom He pleases. So Allah will not forgive shirk. Shirk is a crime which will not be forgiven until you repent, until you repent before you die. So if you die in the state of shirk, you are going straight to hell, according to the Islamic understanding of Quran. 
Whosoever testifies that there is none worthy of worship except God, this is Prophet Muhammad in one of the hadith in the prophetic tradition where Prophet Muhammad uh, said certain statements about Islam and it is hadith which is what explains the Quran to us. We have almost 60,000 attending a hadith from Prophet Muhammad and in one of the hadiths which is narrated by Bukhari and Muslim he stated whosoever testifies that there is none no one worthy of worship except God he is one there is no partners to him there are no partners to him and Muhammad is a slave and messenger and Jesus is the slave of God and his messenger and his word which he bestowed upon Mary and he is a spirit from him and paradise is truth and hell is truth such a person will enter paradise no matter what his actions are like. Bukhari and Muslim. Now the definition of Trinity. We have to see whether Trinity actually constitutes ship. Does belief in Trinity lead you to ship? That is the question. First definition of Trinity, which is a very interesting definition by Thomas Jefferson. I'm sure that uh, James White is aware of who Thomas Jefferson is. He is the writer of Declaration of Independence. He stated about Trinity, an unintelligible proposition of Platonic mysticism that three are one and one is three, and yet one is not three and three are not one. I never had sense enough to comprehend the Trinity and it, it appeared to me that comprehension must proceed, must proceed ascent. Thomas Jefferson. Now we go to James White's, Dr. James White's definition of Trinity. Dr. James White states in his article, the doctrine of the Trinity is simply that there is one eternal being of God, indivisible, in infinite. This one being of God is shared by three co-equal, shared by three co-equal, co-eternal persons, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. Okay, so let's go to the Quran, the originator of the concept of shirk. I've already explained to you the Quran is the first book to use the word shirk in the way it's used. The concept of shirk originates from the Quran, so Quran is the first authority we refer to in order to understand whether Trinity is shirk or not. What does Quran say? First of all, Quran has a very interesting formula for us. O people of the scripture, chapter 4, verse number 171. O people of the scripture, do not exceed the limits in your religion. Ya Ahlul Kitab, la ta'udu fi dinikum. Do not exceed limits, nor say of God, but the truth. Wa la ta'udu illallah, alallah, illa al-haq. The Messiah, Jesus, son of Mary, was a messenger of God. And his word which he bestowed on Mary and a spirit created by him. So believe in one God and his messenger. Believe in God and his messengers. Say not three. Say not three. Seize it. Desist. It will be better for you. So Quran tells you say not three. How do the Christians say three today? How do the Christians say three? I will come to address that issue in a minute. Quran chapter 5, verse number 72 to 4. 74. Surely they have disbelieved who say, they have disbelieved who say, Allah is the Messiah, son of Mary. Meaning, God is the Messiah, son of Mary. James White, in his paper on Trinity, on his website, he has stated that Yahweh is Jesus, or Jesus identifies himself as Yahweh when he says, I am. Before Abraham was, I am. And that is the term, that is, the, that, that is an expression which Yahweh used for himself. So if Yahweh, who we see as God the Father in the Old Testament, if he's saying that he is Jesus, or Jesus is saying he's Yahweh, this is exactly what you're saying. And that's what Quran is talking about. That Allah is the Messiah, son of Mary. But the Messiah said, وَقَالَ الْمَسِيحُ Ya Bani Israel, Abudu. Ya Bani Israel, Abudu Allah. Rabbi wa Rabbakum. O people of Israel, the Messiah said, O people of Israel, 
worship one God, my God and your God. So believe in God and His messengers. Verily, whosoever sets up partners with Allah. Now this is a clear passage which is actually stating that belief in Trinity necessitates shirk. In the Quran, if Dr. James White studied the Quran carefully, he would have never chosen this topic for a debate today. Never would he have chosen this topic. If you study the Quran carefully, Dr. White, you would not choose this topic. I say it again. Because there is a clear, explicit verse in the Quran which is saying that Trinity is shirk. Because Jesus, look what Jesus is saying in the Quran. Surely they have disbelieved to say, Lakat kafar al ladina qalu, inna Allah, who al Masih of the Maryam? Wa qal al Masih, God Almighty is telling us, and Jesus, the son of Mary, the Messiah, said, Ya bani Israel, O children of Israel, the Jews, Wa'budullah, Rabbi wa Rabbukum, worship one God who is my God and your God. Inna humay yushrik billah. In the Humay Yushrik Billah. Pay attention to the word May Yushrik. The root word is Shirk. Sharaka. In the Humay Yushrik Billah. Fakat Haram Allah alayhi Jannah. The paradise. Whoever ascribes partner with Allah, the paradise will be forbidden for them. And they abode with the fire. Quran is telling us those who believe that Jesus is Yahweh or Yahweh is Jesus. Or they believe Allah is Jesus or Jesus is Allah. They are fire. Their abode will be fire. And Jannah, paradise, will be forbidden for them. So this is very clear, ladies and gentlemen. Congratulations, Dr. James White, a proven from Quran that Trinity definitely necessitates shirk. So there are other passages in the Quran which deal with the topic. But I will leave them aside for rebuttals or for, for Dr. James White to respond, uh, response or comment on them. Then, who is God Almighty? Dr. James White said in one of his previous debates with Jalal Abu Ru, he stated that the Quran never gave us great knowledge of the doctrine of Trinity. And then again he stated, I have never seen an even semi-accurate definition of the Trinity in the Quran. And this he stated in the ninth minute of that debate. You can go and check it. This is what Dr. White said. I will request from Dr. White not to make generalizations, violent generalizations like that. Because a scholar doesn't do that. And you're a scholar, Dr. James White. Quran does not even give a semi-accurate definition of Trinity. This is an absurdity, ladies and gentlemen. Read the verse of the Quran carefully. Chapter 4, verse 171. Do not say three. Three what? Three what? Do the Christians say three? The question is, do the Christians say three? Yes, they say three. How do they say three? They say three persons in one trinity. Three persons in tri-unity. Quran is making a general statement which is applicable to all the Christians. Do not say three. Desist. It will be better for you. So Quran is clearly stating that Christians say three. Don't say three. Whether you say three persons, three gods, three deities, three beings, or three persons within one trinity, Quran is saying don't say it. Don't, say it. don't go there. Because God is only one God. He doesn't share his divinity, his attributes, his qualities with anyone. So that is the definition of Trinity within the Quran which is accurate. You cannot say that it is inaccurate, Dr. James White. If you study the Quran carefully, you would never make such a claim. Then in another place, Lakat Kafar al Ladina Qalu, Inna Allah, who al Masih ibn Maryam. Chapter 5, verse 72, where Allah says that those are blasphemers. Who say that Jesus, the son of Mary, the Messiah, is God or is Allah? Do you say that? Yes, you say that. You say Yahweh is Jesus and Jesus is Yahweh. Jesus is identifying himself as Yahweh when he says, Before Abraham was, I am. You stated that clearly. 
in your article that God contains why. So why do you say that Quran doesn't give us an accurate definition of Trinity? This is very accurate. This is what you claim with Jesus, that He is God. And Quran is saying that, that's what you claim. And then Quran in the next verse says, Do not ascribe partners with Allah. And Jesus is saying that. Do not ascribe partners with Allah. Paradise will be forbidden for you, and your abode will be fire. So, so much with the Quranic knowledge of Dr. James White. Trinity is here according to the Old Testament. I've already proven, ladies and gentlemen, that Quran definitely states that Trinity is definitely shirk. There are no questions about this. Anyone who says otherwise just simply doesn't know what the Quran is saying. And I will leave Dr. White to respond, uh, respond on this. Now, some Christians may object. They say, okay, that's Quran. We don't believe in Quran. We believe in the Old Testament and the New Testament. So prove to us that Trinity is actually shared from the Old Testament or the New Testament or the Bible. Quran definitely stating that Trinity is shirk. And shirk is one of the worst crimes you can commit. Now, Old Testament. Pay attention, ladies and gentlemen. Book of Exodus, chapter 8, verse 10. There is none like unto the Lord our God. Deuteronomy 435. Unto thee it was sure that thou mightest know that the Lord he is God, there is none else beside him. Deuteronomy 439. Know therefore this day and consider it in thy heart that the Lord he is God in heaven above and upon the earth beneath there is none else. Deuteronomy 6, 4 to 5. Hear of Israel, the Shema, famous Shema. All the Christians know this. Hear of Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. 2 Samuel 7, 22. Wherefore thou art great, O Lord God, for there is none like thee. Listen to the words carefully, ladies and gentlemen. There is none like thee. Who is this thee? The question is, who is this thee? The Israelite prophets will tell you who this thee is. Neither is there any God beside thee, according to all that we have heard with our ears. 1 King 8, 23. Lord God of Israel, there is no God like thee, in heaven above or on earth beneath. The Lord God of Israel. Who is this Lord God of Israel? We will come to know in a minute. Psalms 86, 8. Among the gods there is none like unto thee. O Lord, neither are there any works like unto the, the, your works. Again, Psalms 89, 6. For who is in the heaven can be compared unto the Lord? Who is on, into the heavens who can compare unto the Lord? Who among the sons of mighty can be likened unto the Lord? Amazing. Psalms 113, 5. Who is like unto the Lord our God, who dwelleth on high? No, there is no one like him. Old Testament again and again is saying, there is no one like him. So who is this? The Christians identify this God as one God, consisting of three persons, Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Now we have to see, we have to see, does Old Testament identify one of these persons? Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, guess what? Yes, Old Testament tells us who is this God. Old Testament tells us clearly who is this God who is not like no one else. I'm reciting the verses. You heard them clearly. There is no one like him. No one shares his divinity. So we go on to see who is this God. Prophet Malachi Chapter 2, verse 10. Have we not all one Father? Hath not one God created us? God the Father, one God who created us. Father is the creator in the Old Testament, ladies and gentlemen. Very, very clearly, an Israelite prophet is telling you that God the Father is the creator, who is the God, who is the only God, there is none like him, there is none beside him, there is no one like on the sky and on the earth like him. SubhanAllah. Amazing. Glory be to this God. Who is this? 1 Chronicles 29.10 Wherefore David blessed the Lord before all the congregation. Listen to me carefully ladies and gentlemen. And David said, 
Blessed be thou, Lord God of Israel, our Father, our Father, forever and ever. So David is identifying the Father as the God of Israel. And the God of Israel, as I recited the verses, there's no one like him. There's no uh, Exodus 8 10, there's none like unto the Lord. There's none. So if you imagine Father, there is none like unto the Lord our God the Father. Unto thee it was sure that thou mightest know that Lord he is God the Father, there is none else beside him. I am, put, I am adding the word Father in the verses that you realize who this Father is, who this God is, there is none like him. Okay. Book of Isaiah, chapter 63, verse 16, Doubtless, doubtless thou art our Father, though Abraham be ignorant of us, and Israel acknowledges not, thou, O Lord, art our Father, our Redeemer, thy name is from everlasting. Father again, book of Isaiah. In the Old Testament, Father is the only God. He is the only God who has been worshipped. And in the Old Testament, Yahweh is the only God. Elohim is the only God. Father is the only God. Where are the other two persons within the Trinity? There is none like Him. No one shares any divinity with Him. So where did these two other persons come from? That is the question. I will come to address that in due course. Now, examine. Let's go to the New Testament to see who the true God is. Jesus was a Jew. He was born to a Jewish mother and he came to fulfill the Jewish law. Book of Matthew chapter 5 verse 17. Think not I've come to destroy the law, but I've come to fulfill the law. The law and the prophets. So he mentioned the prophets. The word prophets is there in your Bible. So who are the prophets? Isaiah, Malachi and the writer of 1 Chronicles. All of whom are saying, Father is the God of Israel. And there is none like him. So Jesus is saying, I am fulfilling the prophets and the law. So, book of John, chapter 8, verse 54. Jesus answered, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father that honoreth me. Of whom ye say that he is your God. SubhanAllah. Who is this God? Jesus is the book of John. Chapter 8, verse 54 is saying, You Jews, he's speaking to the Jews, of whom ye say that Father is the God. So Jews believe Father is the God and Jesus acknowledged that in the New Testament. Jesus acknowledging the Father is the true God. That's the God you believe in. There is no other God you believe in. Okay. We go further. And Jesus answered him. This is when the Jewish scribe came to Jesus in the book of Mark, chapter 12, verse 29 to 30. Came with Shema. He asked, Master, what is the first commandment? How much time do we have? Oh my God. Okay. I think I will have to do the rest of my 15 minutes. So, in Shema, Mark 12, 29, Jesus is saying, He's answering the scribe, the question of the scribe. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And this is the law of the Jews, ladies and gentlemen. And then he's saying, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. And the scribe said unto him, Well, Master, thou hast said the truth, for there is one God, and there is none other but he. Ladies and gentlemen, pay attention to these words. The scribe replied to Jesus, he said to him, there is one God and there is no other but He. And who is this God? Jesus is saying that's the Father. In book of John chapter 8 verse 54, when Jesus said to the Jews that, Father is your God, about whom you say that He is your God, Father. So this Jewish scribe in book of Mark chapter 12 verse 29 is saying, There is no one but He, that is Father. And then Jesus said to him, Thou art not, thou art not far from the kingdom of God. You are very close to the kingdom of God. You are not far. If Jesus was the God, if He was divine, if He wanted to teach this person that I am the God, this was the first time, this was the best time He could have said it. Jesus had other things to say. Book of Matthew chapter 5 verse 30, He told them about divorce. It was said to you 
that when you divorce, a certificate will be given to you. But I say to you, that divorce cannot be done except for the immoral reasons. And anyone who's divorced cannot be remarried. Anyone who marries a divorced woman will be causing her to commit adultery. Jesus had time to tell you that. But he didn't have time to tell you that I am God. Worship me, I am one of the Trinity. There is another one, Holy Spirit. Worship him as well. But he's saying there is only one God. That's the Father. And then the scribe says, yes, there is only one God, which is the Father, whom Jesus acknowledged. And then Jesus said, you are very close to the kingdom of God. Okay. Then again, book of John 4.21. Jesus said unto the woman, the woman came to Jesus. And she spoke to him. And Jesus said to her, we know that we worship. We know we worship. For salvation is of the Jews. Jesus is saying, for salvation is of the Jews. Jews worshipped Father. Jews did not worship Jesus and Holy Spirit. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your Bible I'm quoting. And this is addressed to the Christians in particular. Jews worship Father alone. Book of John, chapter 8, verse 54, where Jesus acknowledged that divinity, that he said to the Jews that this is the Father whom you say is God. 30 minutes. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for listening to me. I have some uh, of my presentation uh, which is uh, left and I will come and uh, address that in my program. Thank you very much for listening to me. Wassalamu alaikum. Discussion this evening, does belief in the Trinity necessitate shirk and you're going to see a number of the very same texts uh, that uh, were just discussed, presented by myself, because it is an important subject to what we have to do is define definitions. We have to come up with definitions. We need to understand exactly what is going on as we discuss the Trinity and Shirk. The only meaningful way of addressing this question is by accurately defining the terms that are being used in our discussion. Now, I, I did find it somewhat interesting. I'm not sure that uh, this may be the first debate of the main debates uh, where my opponent declared himself the victor before I had a chance to speak. Um, that is an interesting way of approaching it. I, I will leave that up to you uh, as to who defines the terms and uh, who deals with the text in the best way. So we do need, obviously, to look at what is the doctrine of the Trinity, Secondly, we do need to define very clearly uh, what is the concept of shirk, what it means. Uh, and third, and of course most importantly, uh, does the Quran accurately and correctly identify the Trinity when it condemns excess in religion? I was just told that I was uh, very wrong in my understanding. Let's find out. Let's find out uh, as we look at these things. Let's begin first and foremost with the doctrine of the Trinity itself. I'd like to offer you a basic definition. Within the one being that is God, there exists eternally three co-equal and co-eternal persons, namely the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, if you are uh, color challenged or can't see the projector, uh, and sometimes guys can't see red, and there are two words there uh, that I have emphasized so that you can see them. They are the words being and person. These are not synonymous words. Every day we use these words in different ways. We recognize that a rock has being, but it does not have personhood. You can insult a rock all you want, it's never going to take offense. Try it. Well, I won't do it in public. But uh, uh, being and person are two different things. This is a distinction that must be understood. Being is what makes something what it is. Person is what makes someone who they are. We are all human beings, but we are differentiated on the level of personhood. While we may share a common existence as human beings, we are differentiated from one another on the level of personhood. We make that kind of distinction. The Bible makes that kind of distinction in describing the one being of God and then describing three persons uh, as having divine attributes, the divine name. The name Yahweh, for example, is used of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in the Scriptures, and that is where the doctrine of the Trinity comes from. 
Now please understand, the Trinity is not saying that there are three beings who are one being. Thomas Jefferson, of course, an unbeliever who cut the Bible up, uh, didn't bother to actually find out what the doctrine was that he was mocking. We are not saying that there are three beings that are one being, as he might have thought. We are not saying there are three persons who are one person. We're not saying one plus one plus one equals three. One being, eternal and unlimited, shared eternally by three divine persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You may not believe it, but obviously if you're going to be a person of truth, then you need to accurately define it as it is understood historically by the Christian faith. Now why do we believe this? Some people will say, well, it's because of church goals. Or some people will say it's because the council said so. I am a biblical Trinitarian. I believe all of Scripture. I believe only Scripture. And when I believe all of Scripture and only Scripture, what I come to understand is the doctrine of the Trinity. There are three biblical foundations to the doctrine of the Trinity. Foundation one is absolute monotheism. I appreciated much of what Adnan said when we start quoting from the Old Testament. He misidentifies the term Father in the Old Testament as if the Old Testament distinguishes between Father, Son, and Spirit. It does not. But he quoted the very same text of Deuteronomy 4.35 that I use in debating Mormons all the time. Mormons are polytheists. They believe that there are many gods, literally an unlimited number of gods. And so I've gone to Salt Lake City, I've gone to Utah, and defended biblical Christianity against Mormonism, because Mormonism is a polytheistic religion. We are monotheists. We believe there is only one true God creator of heaven and earth. That is the foundation of the doctrine of the Trinity. The second foundation revealed to us in all the scripture is the existence of three divine persons. That is, the Father is not confused with the Son, the Son is not confused with the Spirit, the Spirit is not confused with the Father. There are people who call themselves Christians who believe that. Uh, you may have run into Jesus-only Pentecostals, the oneness Pentecostal movement, that denies the doctrine of the Trinity and actually says that in essence Jesus was praying to himself in the Garden of Gethsemane. That has been rejected by the Christian church down through the centuries, and it certainly cannot be substantiated on the basis of the Bible. I've debated their representatives as well. The third foundation, then, is the co-equality and co-eternality of those persons. And that is, the evidence that demonstrates that the Father is truly God, the evidence that demonstrates that the Son, while distinguished from the Father, is described as the creator of all things, is described as Yahweh. Old Testament passages about Yahweh are applied to Jesus in the New Testament, Hebrews chapter 1, John chapter 12, etc., etc. And that the Spirit of Yahweh, the Spirit of God, is distinguished from the Father and the Son, and yet is described as God as well. This is all revelation that takes place in the New Testament specifically. The doctrine of the Trinity is revealed in the incarnation of Jesus Christ and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the early church. And the New Testament then becomes the record of that revelation. We need to understand because there is confusion. The terms Father and Son are not physical terms when we use these terms of God. The Father is not married to anyone. The son is not the result of a marriage. He is not an offspring or anything along those lines. I have met many Muslims who thought that that's exactly what it was that Christians uh, believe. The relationship of the father and the son is timeless. This is very important. Please hear me. When we speak of father and son as creatures, a father always precedes the son in existence. We are talking about an eternal relationship. There is not a time when the Son did not exist. The Bible describes Him as having eternally existed. He is the creator of all things. The relationship of Father and Son is eternal. It does not come into existence at a point in time. For example, uh, since we're in London, I thought it would be good to make reference to C.S. Lewis. He used an analogy to describe this of two books. It just so happens I have some books sitting here. If you have one book sitting on top of another book, you can say that the book on top owes its position to the book on the bottom. But if you take out the element of time, no longer can you say, well, obviously the bottom book was put there first. Once you take the element of time out, and time is a function of creation, and God existed before there was anything else, in his solitary glory, still, before time itself existed, the Father and the Son existed as Father and Son. There is a, it's a description of a relationship not an origination. So the relationship of the 
Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is an eternal relationship that is timeless. The Son did not become the Son at a particular point in time in the past. Now, it needs to be reemphasized once again. The bedrock of monotheism defines the Trinity. It is the very foundation of our faith. But this must be understood as well. Monotheism and Unitarianism are not the same things. And throughout Adnan's presentation, they were assumed to be the same things. I am a Trinitarian or monotheist. A Unitarian is a person who insists that the being of God can only be shared by one person. That's a Unitarian. You can assert it all you want. That's not the same thing as proving it. I am a monotheist who is a Trinitarian. The being of God is unlimited. And why, therefore, can it not be shared by three divine persons? That becomes the question. If God's revelation is such that that is what the revelation teaches us, then that is what we should believe. I am a Trinitarian monotheist. I am not a Unitarian. You cannot just simply assume, well, Yahweh is Unitarian. Why? The New Testament writers didn't think so. They described, they used verses of the Father that identified Him as Yahweh. They used verses of the Son that identified Him as Yahweh. Were they just confused? You might say they, they were, but that's what the Christian believes is what they reveal. And you need to understand that if we're going to have a dialogue that is well, uh, well worded. The Trinity, of course, was well known by AD 600. The Councils of Nicaea, Constantinople, Chalcedon had clearly proclaimed the belief. The Athanasian Creed was well known. Augustine had written entire volumes on the subject of the Trinity long before Muhammad. And so there's no question that at the time of uh, the prophethood of Muhammad, you have a clear understanding of what the doctrine of the Trinity is. That's important because some people feel that maybe that just wasn't something that was understood. Now, what about the Quran on the subject of shirk? As was mentioned, the root of the term simply means to share or association continues to be used today to speak of business associations, corporations, etc. in the Arabic language and in secular usage in the Arabic language. The uh, root is used 168 times uh, in the Quran, not always about the subject of uh, idolatry or anything like that. Let's look at some of the texts they were quoted to you before, and now you get to see them uh, on the screen. And for those who are not Muslims, that might be helpful to you uh, to know what the Quran is saying. Surah 31, 13, O my dear son, ascribe no partners unto a law, lo, to ascribe partners unto them is a tremendous wrong. This is the concept of ascribing partners with a law. The question we will have to ask tonight is, does the Quran tell us what kind of a, of a scription of partnership this is? I think it very clearly does, as we will see. Let's look at uh, Surah 22-31. Being true in faith to Allah, and never assigning partners to Him, if anyone assigns partners to Allah, it, it is as if He had fallen from heaven and been snatched up by birds, or the wind had swooped like a bird on its prey and thrown Him into a far place. This is what happens to the person who commits shirk. This is the sin of idolatry. We also see this in Surah 6-1. Praise be to Allah who created the heavens and the earth and made the darkness and the light. Yet those who reject faith hold others as equal with their guardian Lord. Hold others as equal with their guardian Lord. Please note the language that is used. Then notice this. I believe this text was also uh, utilized Surah 364. Say, O people of the book, come to common terms as between us and you, that we worship none but Allah, and we associate no partners with Him, that we erect not from among ourselves lords and patrons other than Allah. Now, what kind of association is this? Have we seen anything so far? where the Quran defines for us the doctrine of the Trinity as being one being of God shared by three persons. Is that anywhere in the Quran? This is what I will ask. I don't know. He says it, it says three. Three what? Here, the association is from among ourselves, lords and patrons, other than Allah. It has nothing to do with persons. It has nothing to do with Christians' belief and was well known at this point in history, the doctrine of the Trinity is. If they then turn back, say, bear witness that we at least are Muslims bowing to Allah's will. Or we also saw Surah 4 quoted. O ye people of the book, believe in what we have now revealed, confirming what was already with you before we change the face and fame of some of you. 
beyond all recognition and turn them hindwards or curse them as we curse the Sabbath breakers. For the decision of a law must be carried out. Now notice what it said here. A law forgiveth not that partners should be set up with him, but he forgiveth anything else to whom he pleaseth. To set up partners with the law is to devise a sin most heinous and deep. This is why Adnan had to try to make the assertion, Oh, a law is God the Father. Where does the Quran say this? Where does the Quran say this? Where does the Old Testament? The Old Testament does use the term Father of God as the Creator. It also uses it of Jesus prophetically in Isaiah chapter 9. It says He's the Father of time, the eternal Father. The terms Father, Son, and Spirit are New Testament revelation. They're not Old Testament revelation. So what is this ascription? It sounds to me like what the Quran is saying is saying you are not to ascribe gods with Allah. Where's persons? Where is a recognition that we believe there is only one true eternal being of God? I'm sure that since Anad says that the Quran correctly and knowledgeably defines the Trinity, and since this was well known at that time, that uh, he will show us exactly where this three doesn't cut it. Uh, that, that could be three gods, and as we're going to see, that's exactly what it is. Notice, for example, uh, Surah 6841. Or have they some partners in a law that let them produce their partners if they are truthful? Produce them? Uh, you mean like uh, the, the, the pagan deities, the, the idols that the people in Mecca were worshipping? Uh, things like that? Maybe that's exactly what it's talking about. Surah chapter 4, verses 171-172. Well, people, the book commit no excesses in your religion, nor say of a law but the truth. Christ Jesus, the son of Mary, was no more than an apostle of the law, and his word, which he bestowed on Mary, and a spirit proceeding from him. So believe in the law and his apostles. Then it says, say not Trinity. And as Adnan was correct in pointing out, it's literally the word three. It's not the word Trinity specifically. Desist would be better for you. For a law is one a law. One person? Unitarian? What? One Allah. Glory be to him, for exalt is he above having a son. Having a son? That sounds like the writer of this, these words thinks that Christians believe that, that God uh, got married and had a, had a child. Well, certainly that's not what Christians believed. And yet that seemingly is what's being said. To him belong all things in the heavens and on earth. And not as the laws that expose and affairs. Christ saith not to serve and worship a law, nor the angels those heirs to a law, those who disdain his worship and are arrogant, he will gather them all together unto himself. To answer, how about Surah 5, 72 through 78, they do blaspheme who say, A law is Christ, the Son of Mary. But said Christ, O children of Israel, worship a law, my Lord and your Lord. And I, I mentioned in passing. Uh, many times I hear Muslims saying, We can't trust what the Gospels say about Jesus, because they, they were written by eyewitnesses. Why is that? How they know that is another issue. And yet here we have words removed by 600 years without any intervening historical foundation, and yet the same people will accept them as being absolutely accurate. We need to have one standard for these things, not one standard for the Muslim and one standard for the Christian. We need to apply the same standard all the way across. Whoever joins, please note this, other gods with Allah. Whoever, this is in the context of Jesus. This is in the context of the three. Whoever joins other gods with Allah, Allah will forbid him to guard the fire will be his above. <laughs> Does the doctrine of the Trinity associate other gods with Allah? No. It says the law is the only true God and that God exists eternally as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The wrongdoers be no one to help. They do blaspheme who say, a law is one of three in the Trinity. Who says that? Christians never said that. Christians never made the identification that Adnan has made, that a law has to be God the Father. Where does the Quran say that? Where does the Bible say that? It doesn't. And so where have Christians ever said a law is one of three in the Trinity? Could it be that the, Trinity, that the, that the Quran is actually saying that the Trinity is the law, Jesus and Mary? We'll find out. A law is one of three in the Trinity, for there is no God except one, a law. Is this not what shirk is? These texts were quoted before as defining what shirk is. Shirk is the association of multiple gods with the law, something else with the law. It has nothing to do with what the Christian God <coughs> is. Continues on. If they desist not from their word of blasphemy, please notice the description of blasphemy. 
Verily, a grievous penalty will befall the blasphemers among them. Why turn they not to Allah and seek his forgiveness? For Allah is often forgiving, most merciful. Christ, the son of Mary, was no more than an apostle. Many were the apostles who passed away before him, his mother. His mother was a woman of truth. Why mention that? Why mention that his mother was a woman of truth unless the author actually has the idea that somehow she is being elevated to the status of a god? That certainly would explain the rest of this because it said they had both to eat their daily food. See how Allah is making signs clear to them, yet see in what ways they are deluded away from the truth. Say, will you worship besides Allah something which hath no power either to harm or benefit you? But Allah, he it is that heareth and knoweth all things. It seems very clear to me. The whole idea is, the, the apologetic argument that we're on at this point, is that Jesus and Mary, since they ate food, can't be God. Denying the possibility of incarnation for Jesus. But why include Mary? Why even, even make mention of her? Unless the idea of shirk in the Quran is the association of God set with Allah. Continuing on. Say, O people of the book, if you seek not your religion to bound to what is proper, trespassing beyond the truth, nor follow the vain desires of people who went wrong in times gone by, who misled many and strayed themselves from the even way. Notice what it says now. Curses were pronounced on those among the children of Israel who rejected faith by the tongue of David and Jesus, son of Mary, because they disobeyed and persisted in excesses. Blasphemy, curses, hellfire. These are the words of the Quran. So are we out of line to ask, no, in fact, demand that the Quran be specific, clear, and accurate in what it's identifying as error that will damn one's soul? And if the Quran is condemning polytheism, the creation of other gods, and the Trinity insists that the uh, distinctions that it defines are not external, not a violation of monotheism, then where is the chronic condemnation of the historical doctrine of the Trinity? That is my question for you this evening. The text continues on. Behold, Allah will say, here's, I think, the key text. O oh, Jesus, the son of Mary, didst thou say unto men, worship me and my mother as gods in derogation of Allah? What Christian has ever said that? Oh, I know some people said, well, there was this uh, small group out in the desert in Arabia once that uh, uh, deified Mary or something. Well, if you're going to say that what the Quran is talking about is some group of which none have survived, fine, that means it doesn't address the doctrine of the Trinity. But if you're going to say it addresses the doctrine of the Trinity, what's it talking about here? Is this what the Quran understands as the Trinity? Did you say unto men, worship me and my mother as gods in derogation of the law? Is this not clearly defining shirk sure, as the association of gods with the law? Now, if this is the Trinity, then the author of the Quran did not understand the Trinity. And whether you accept the Trinity or not, isn't it rather obvious that in AD 600, even a law knew what the Trinity was? If these are his words, then they would accurately represent the Trinity, right? That would seem to be the case. Now, we are told that Jesus will respond, Glory to thee, never could I say that, uh, but I had no right to say, and I said such a thing, thou wast indeed have known it. Thou knowest what is in my heart, though I know not what is in thine, for thou knowest in full all that is hidden. Obviously, the writer of this had never read Matthew 11, 27, where Jesus said just the opposite of that, uh, but that's another issue for another, another time. Continues on to say, Never said I to them, aught except what thou dost command me to say, to win worship of law, my Lord and your Lord. And I was a witness over them, whilst I dwelt with them. When thou dost take me up, thou dost watch over them, and thou art a witness to all things. So, the question this evening is, where is the shirk? Where is the shirk? The Quran never does give an accurate, meaningful definition of the Trinity when it condemns belief in three. Not once. We haven't seen one. Adnan says, well, you just got to study your, your Quran more. I quote every text he did. And it never gives a definition of the Trinity. If I, if, if I had it, I've debated many people, the Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses and atheists and the liberals and so on and so forth. And if I debate the doctrine of the Trinity, I at least expect that the other person is going to define it correctly. When I debate Muslims, if I'm going to talk about Tawheed, I'm going to talk about Tawheed the way you define it, not the way I'd like to define it. We've got to start with some common language, do we not? And so where is that definition? Three what? 
Seraphim, three gods. Where is the discussion of monotheism? Where is the recognition? You say that there is but one God, but you distinguish on the Unitarian and Trinitarian level, and here's where you're wrong. It's not there. Where is the evidence that the author of the Quran understood the very doctrine that he condemned men to hellfire for believing? Where is it? We haven't seen it so far. Hopefully we'll see it in the next 15 minutes. The Quran clearly refers to polytheism, possibly even viewing the Trinity as a law, Mary, and Jesus, which of course has never been the doctrine of the Trinity in any way, shape, or form. And while the Quran uses terms like blasphemy, unbelief, curses, excess, and hellfire, it never shows the slightest understanding of the centrality of monotheism to the established doctrine of the Trinity that was well known at the beginning of the 7th century. If the description of three in the Quran is meant to address the Trinity, then the author of the Quran was ignorant of the truth about what Christians had believed literally for centuries at that point in time. And if it is not, then where is the Quranic basis for identifying the true doctrine of the Trinity as sure? Now, Adnan has raised all sorts of issues in his opening presentation. I will have more time to address them in my rebuttal. But he specifically raised all sorts of issues uh, that would be more properly in a debate on the doctrine of the Trinity. And in fact, in two days, I'll be debating another Islamic apologist on the subject of the deity of Christ, which of course is a subset of that great uh, argument uh, on the doctrine of the Trinity. And I'll be glad to address uh, the many texts that were presented at that time. We're not here to, to debate the Trinity. I'll, I'll respond to what has been presented because I don't want anyone to be confused. There are answers to everything that's been presented, especially when you understand that Father in the Old Testament is not a distinction between Father, Son, and Spirit. Father simply means creator. Even the text you read, that's, that's the, words, the way it's being used. And if you try to make it that, then even Jesus described his father in Isaiah chapter 9, where he's called the uh, everlasting father, the prince of peace, mighty God. That's not the Old Testament definition of father. So we can leave that to the side. Secondly, he seems to assume Unitarianism for Yahweh. Yet Yahweh uses plural nouns in himself, and Yahweh is used with Father, Son, and Spirit in the New Testament. The question tonight simply is this. Islam comes after my faith. I know you believe that Jesus and all the prophets were Muslims and so on and so forth, but the historical fact is that the defining document of the Islamic faith comes after my faith and its books. My New Testament existed long before the time of the Quran. I know exactly what the New Testament looked like in the days of Muhammad. We have that evidence, there's no question. And my faith had struggled with divisions, just as Islam had divisions and continues to have divisions to this day. And in the year 600, just using that as a good number, it was clearly known what the doctrine of the Trinity was. Here's my thesis for you. If, as Adnan has said, and I've actually talked to a couple Muslims who said, no, the, the, the Quran never addresses the Christian doctrine of but they seem to be in the small way. I've talked to imams, I've tried to allow Muslims to define their own faith. It seems to me that I'm not a safe position. Yes, the Quran is specifically addressing the Christian doctrine of the Trinity. That seems to be how I understood it. If that is the case, then the result is that the Quran demonstrates ignorance on the part of its author. Therefore, it can't be word Because even if you reject the Trinity, in the year 600, God knew what it was. God knew what Christians believed. God knew that the Christians did not believe in worshiping Jesus and Mary as God separate from the law. And so that's the question that we have to answer this evening. The whole reason that I asked for this particular subject was because over and over again I've heard it basically danced around. No one dealt with the issue directly. It was just assumed Hopefully this evening, you have heard an accurate definition of the doctrine of the Trinity. And we have looked, and the fact that I didn't know what Adnan was going to be saying, he didn't know what I was going to be saying, we used the same text from the Quran. We came to the same text, separate from one another. 
But the point is that the text that we came to do not accurately define the doctrine of the Trinity. And so if the Quran is the only basis upon which you can define that, then the thesis of our debate this evening has been established. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Dr. White. There will now be uh, both speakers will give a 15 minute rebuttal uh, to what has already been said. Speaker number one will be Adnan, uh, speaker number two will be James. After that, there will be another change of tape. <coughs> so I'd like to ask Adnan to. Ladies and gentlemen, congratulations, Dr. James White failed to address the issue for the whole half an hour. The issue, Dr. White, was does belief in Trinity necessitate ship? You failed to address the issue. You are giving us the definition or commentary of the Quran rather than addressing the topic. So, I have already substantiated in my presentation, uh, in the first presentation, that doctrine of Trinity is definitely should because Jesus says, in the home you should with love. That if you ascribe partners with Allah, now Dr. James White said, where, where does in the Quran it say that Allah is God the Father? Quran doesn't say that. I said, we identify God the Father is the God being referred to in the Old and the New Testament, which is Allah. Why did I say that, Dr. White? Same verses which you read yourself. If you read them carefully, verse number 72, chapter 5 of the Quran, it states, Waqal al Masih said the Messiah, Ya Bani Israel, O children of Israel, Allah, worship Allah, worship God, Rabbi wa Rabbakum, my Lord, my God, and your God. Where did Jesus say that? The question is, where did Jesus say that? Jesus said that, ladies and gentlemen, in the book of Mark, chapter 12, 29. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. I've already stated this Lord our God, one God, is the, the Shema formula of the book of Genesis. And Jews did not know any other God but the Father. I've already proven that. Then, book of John. Where Jesus says again, chapter 4, 4 1, 20, uh, verse number 21, that we know what we worship, for salvation is for the Jews. But the hour cometh, hey, hey, listen to me carefully, ladies and gentlemen, but the hour cometh, and now is when the true worshippers, and now when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in the truth, God in the spirit, and they were, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit. So Father is the one who Jesus is refer referring to, to be worshipped. So Father is the one to be worshipped. That's why the salvation is for the Jews. He's saying that clearly in this passage. So that is the God who Jesus is referring to. Worship the Father. And that's why the Jews are salvation. And that's the same God. Chapter 5, verse number 72. Oh, oh, oh Allah, Rabbi wa Rabbakum. Worship Allah, my God and your God. Dr. White, I'm surprised at asking me a question, where does it say that in the Quran, the Father is the God? Well, Jesus referred to a God in the New Testament, and he said, worship Him, He's our God. And that's the Father. That's why I say it. That's why I say that's the Father, the God which has been referred to in the Quran, which is clearly stated. Well, where did the Christians ever say that Mary is to be worshipped? Dr. White, I don't think you read your own articles. You should read your own articles on your website where you're condemning the Catholics for worshipping Mary. And what does the verse say? The verse, chapter 5, verse number 116. Look at the word. Ittaqiduni. Ittaqiduni. Jesus is saying, Allah will ask Jesus, Did you ask people? Did you ask people? 
تَخِذُونِي وَأُمِّي إِلَٰهِينَ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ Did you tell people to take me and my mother instead of Allah as to be worshipped? Deities to be worshipped. Where does the Trinity, um, where is the Trinity mentioned in this world, Dr. White? You said this is not the right definition of Trinity. Quran doesn't say that Mary is part of Trinity. In this verse, the word Trinity is not mentioned. It is your speculation. You force, you're forcing this view upon us that this is Trinity. It's not Trinity. Quran is simply saying that Jesus, did you ask people to worship me? Which you do. You worship Jesus as God and worship Mary, my mother, instead of Allah, instead of the Father, the God. And which is what the Catholics do. So the Christians are doing it. How is Quran wrong? Quran is not wrong. Quran is absolutely accurate. You yourself are condemning Catholics for worshipping Mary and you have an audacity, Dr. White, to come and tell us the Quran got it wrong. Dr. White, I'm afraid you got it wrong. So, Dr. White raised a number of issues. Wrong translation of 572, Dr. White translated. Uh, the chapter 5 verse 72 stating that do not take any God beside Allah. It doesn't say that ladies and gentlemen. It says in the Hawaii you should be Do not ascribe hardness with God. It doesn't mention do not take other gods beside Allah. It doesn't say that. So you got the translation wrong. Dr. White change your Quran translation. I've already answered where Father is Allah in the Quran. Quran is not talking about being. Quran doesn't have to talk about a being. One being, three persons. Quran is not a book of Christian theology. Ladies and gentlemen, Quran is a book of law. It's a revealed, divinely revealed text which is telling us, giving us formulas, universal formulas. Quran is absolutely correct when it tells us, do not say three. The Christians say three. Christians do say three. Three persons in one triunity. That is three. Do not say it, Dr. White. Then Quran, in other words, where Quran says, Lakat kafar al ladina palu, inna Allah huwa al-Masih ibn Maryam. That those are blasphemed who say that Jesus, the son of Mary, is Allah. Dr. White, I have your article here with me. That's why I have to say, unfortunately, that you do not read your own articles. Here you say, on, in the article, the definition of child syndrome, I'm sure you're aware of it. On the page 3 you say, here is, it, here it is the son who utilizes the phrase ego imi in the absolute sense, identifying himself as Yahweh. Dr. White is writing this. The son is identifying himself as Yahweh. Who is Yahweh? Yahweh is God the Father in the Old Testament. I've already proven to you from Malachi, from Isaiah, 1 Chronicles is the Father. Yahweh is the Father. And you're saying that Jesus identifies himself as Yahweh. So in other words, Jesus himself is identifying himself as the God, Allah, Yahweh, Father. In other words, you're saying Jesus is God, Jesus is Allah. This is exactly what the Quran is saying. That those are blasphemers who say that Jesus, son of Mary, is God. How? How did the Quran get it wrong? Can you please come and tell us, Dr. White? I've already addressed the issue of Mary. In the worst way, it says that do not take Oh, did you, oh, son of Mary, did you tell people to take me and my mother as God? It doesn't mention Trinity. And he's already acknowledged in his uh, articles that Mary is worshipped by the Catholics, who are the Christians. So, Dr. White mentioned Augustine. Dr. White mentioned Augustine who wrote treatises, volumes on Trinity. Uh, Dr. White, if you've read Augustine's writings, you must have come across this one as well. Uh, first of all, let me read the verse, which is a very significant verse. In the book of John, chapter 17, verse 1 to 3. Ladies and gentlemen, before I read this verse, I want you to understand this clearly, that Quran clearly states that Trinity is shit. The Old Testament identifies Father as the only true God. Only God, there is no one beside Him. So if you add another God next to Father as a partner, or the co-equal co coexistence or of same Umuusian, or hypostasis, then you are committing shirk. You are literally committing shirk, which is the worst crime in the sight of God. And in the Old Testament, Jesus again and again is saying, salvation is for the Jews, Father is the God of the Jews, and then one, when the man says there is no God but the Father, 
Jesus says that you are close to the kingdom of heaven. Jesus himself is a staunch monotheist. I don't, I'm not saying that you are not monotheist. Dr. Wife and the Christians are monotheist. They are polytheist, polytheistically monotheists. <laughs> or if they are monotheistic, they are, they are monotheistically polytheists. I will leave it for you to understand what I said. So, book of John chapter 17 verse 1 to 3. These words take Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son may also glorify thee, as thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given. Thou hast given. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee. Jesus is speaking about the Father. That they, know, they might know thee, the only true God. Father is the only true God. And these are the words of Jesus. And Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. So Jesus is separating himself from the only true God. This is your Bible. How did you get this trinity? Where did this trinity come from? I'll tell you ladies and gentlemen where the trinity, trinity comes from. From Neoplatonic philosophers in the 2nd, 3rd and 4th century. Dr. Wyatt acknowledged in front of you the trinity was known properly in the 6th century. What about 6 centuries? All those Christians who believed in Christ for six centuries, what were they believing in? What doctrine did they have? Are they all doomed to hell? Would you like to answer this question? Dr. White says sixth century was the time when Trinity was properly known. Do you know what this means, ladies and gentlemen? And do you know when we don't knew our doctrine, our creed? This is a coin in my hand from 86, year 86 of Islam. 70, 76 years after Prophet Muhammad died, and it's got the entire creed of Islam written. There is only one God, and there is no partner beside him. So, ladies and gentlemen, Saint Augustine, as Dr. White brought him up, and he shot himself on the foot. <laughs> Saint Augustine in the fifth century had difficulty in harmonizing this passage with the prevalent Trinitarian doctrine. Which passage? John 17, 1 to 3, where Jesus says, Father is the only true God. Saint Augustine had a problem with this. He had a problem with this. And in his homilies on John, he boldly asserts that John 17.3 means, and I quote, these are the words of Saint Augustine, this is eternal life that they may know, thee and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent as the only true God. This is clear distortion of the text, ladies and gentlemen. This is how Trinity was carved. This is exactly how Trinity was carved. Saint Augustine is changing the word of God. He's saying, he's adding Jesus Christ before he says the only true God. Jesus said Father is the only God, but Saint Augustine added Jesus Christ in the text. And H. A. W. Mayer on page 462, commentary of John, he stated, despite, despite his insistence on the deity of Jesus, May admits that it was, a, it was, and I quote, a perversion of the passage and running counter to the strict monotheism of John when Augustine, Hilary, Beda, Thomas, Aretius, and several others explained John 73 as if the language were that they may know you and Jesus Christ is the only true God. So the Christians themselves are distorting the text of the Bible. 1 John 5, 7, John in Coma is well known distortion. There was an addition in the Bible which was made later in 4th century to substantiate the doctrine of Trinity. You know that. There are three that we have the Father, the Son, and the Word. Father, the Son, and the Spirit. And these three are one. So ladies and gentlemen, where did the Trinity come from? Dr. James White in his debate with Jalal, he said that when Jalal said that Constantine was the one who forced the Trinity upon other people, Dr. James White fiercely um, objected and said that is not true. Ladies and gentlemen, read the history of Council of Nicaea. It will tell you how Trinity was made. Arius was a man who believed that Son had a beginning, therefore he was not a God. And you refer to J. D. Kelly as a patristic authority in your writing in the introduction to Chalcedon. So you accept J. D. Kelly as an authority. J. D. Kelly on page 227 of his book, his book History of the Christian Doctrine, Early Christian Doctrine, he's saying this that Arius believed that Son had a beginning, therefore he could not have been truly a God. So so, in the Council of Nicaea, the issue 
which was being addressed. And when James White said that the doctrine of Trinity was not imposed by Constantine, I agree. I agree with him. Because it was not Constantine who was forcing doctrine of Trinity. He was in fact enforcing the doctrine of binity, not Trinity. There were only two gods in the creed of Nicaea, which was enforced by Constantine on all the Christians of the land. And I read the creed of Nicaea, which is very well known by Dr. James White himself. We believe in one Lord, the Father Almighty, maker of all things, visible and in invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, begotten from Father, only begotten, that is, from the substance of the Father, God from God, that is from the substance of Father. This clause, ladies and gentlemen, was added by Constantine himself, a pagan emperor. It is still debated whether Constantine was a Christian at that time or not. A pagan emperor added a text within the creed of Nicaea, the Christian, Christian creed. He, a pagan emperor added this text that from the substance of Father. And I won't say that, J.D. Kelly says that, whom Dr. White accepts as an authority. Because we're not made of one substance with the Father, through whom all things came into being, things in heaven and things on earth, who because of us men and because of our salvation came down and became, became incarnate, becoming man, suffered and rose again on the third day, ascended to the heavens, and will come to judge the living and the dead and in the Holy Spirit. And we believe in the Holy Spirit. What is Holy Spirit? God, man, created nothing stated in the creed of Nicaea. So constantly enforced. The doctrine of binding, not Trinity. So Constantine was not a Trinitarian. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Since it was the last thing stated, um, Constantine forced nothing on the Council of Nicaea. Anyone familiar with history knows the fact that those who came to the Council of Nicaea were those who would survive the greatest Roman persecution from the Roman state in the preceding three decades before that time. There were, there, there were people there without limbs, without eyes, scars from their bodies because they refused to abandon the faith in Jesus Christ. And are you seriously going to tell me that only 13 years later, they're going to allow a pagan to come in and change their faith? And they're going to go, oh, sounds good to me. Uh, no, histor history tells. J.N.D. Kelly does not say that, by the way. Uh, that is a misreading even of J.N.D. Kelly. Uh, the term was used to identify exactly what was being said against the Arians. I never said the doctrine of Trinity only became known six centuries after the time of Christ. I said that six centuries after the time of Christ, it was well known. It was believed in from the beginning. Read the writings of Ignatius, the, the uh, bishop, martyr bishop, of Antioch as he was going to Rome, wherein he writes seven letters, and over ten times in those letters identifies Jesus Christ as his God. Look at the uh, archaeological find in the past two years in Israel, where they have discovered one of the earliest Christian churches, and in the mosaic on the floor, in memory of our God, Jesus Christ. It is simply historically naive and utterly inaccurate to say anything other than that. But I want to remind you about why we are here this evening. We just had 15 minutes. Uh, I, I was told that I didn't address any of those texts. But you know what? Um, I think I can allow you the audience to find out whether I did or didn't. You can make that judgment for yourself. But in 15 minutes, did we hear anything from the Quran that addressed the issue of being in person? Did we hear anything from the Quran that said that we recognize there is but one God? We were told, oh, Sir Fai is not about the Trinity. Oh, okay. But how do you know any of the other ones are about the Trinity? It's talking about worshiping Jesus. Who is it about? Who did Muhammad run into that it's relevant for Surah 5, 116 through 17 to be revealed? Who? Hopefully we'll find out this evening. I'm on proof that the Bible teaches that the Father is to be worshipped. And of course, all Christians believe exactly that. He then assumes Unitarianism and ignores the rest of the testimony of the New Testament. I'd like to show you uh, where Adnan has done this. Do you remember when he quoted from John chapter 8, verse 54? He quoted John 8 before. Jesus replied, If I glorify myself, my glory is worthless. The one who glorifies me, and by the way, the Old Testament says only God is to be glorified. The one who glorifies me is my Father, about whom you people say he is our God. But, oh, see, see? That means that the only Father in the Old Testament. If I treated the Quran in that way, ignoring what comes before and after and what was going on, you'd have reason to be upset with me. 
Because what is the rest of John chapter 8 about? What's about to happen? Jesus has said just before this, unless you believe that they go, I mean, I am, that a name used of Yahweh in the Old Testament, especially in regards to prophecy in Isaiah 43.10, unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. Do you believe in Jesus the I am? Jesus said, unless you do, you will die in your sins. He had said that. The Jews say, who do you make yourself out to be? Jesus starts talking about the unity that exists between he and the Father, the Father's testimony to him. And within a matter of two or three sentences from the text that Adnan quoted, I'll read the rest of it, verse 55, Yet you do not know him, but I know him. If I were to say that I do not know him, I would be a liar like you, but I do know him, and I obey his teaching. Your father Abraham was overjoyed to see my day, he saw it and was glad. Adnan, when did Abraham see the day of Jesus? Then the Judeans replied, You are not yet fifty years old. Have you seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, I tell you the solemn truth. Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham came into existence, ego, I mean, I am. And you know what the Jews did? They picked up stones to stone him. Because they knew exactly what he was claiming. They knew the name of their God. They knew he was claiming timeless existence to exist before Abraham. He had already said, anyone who keeps my word will never taste death. No mere rasul, no mere prophet ever said things that Jesus said. So if you're going to accept John 8, 54 as being accurate, you've got to accept John 8, 58 too. And it testifies clearly to the deity of Christ. I clearly said in my opening statement, we distinguish clearly between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit because the Bible does. But the fact that the Bible, taken as a whole, uses that one divine name of Father, Son, and Spirit is the reason we are biblical Trinitarians. The one name refers to the being of God, three persons share it. That's what the doctrine of the Trinity is all about. Then we have John chapter 17. He said, well, you quoted Augustine. All I quoted Augustine for was to point out the rather obvious fact. That there had already been great discussions of the doctrine of the Trinity. There wasn't some mysterious thing in the 6th century. For hundreds of years, an accurate doctrine of the Trinity was available. If Adnan could stand up here and use terms like homoousius and hypostasis, why couldn't he go on? If you want to talk to the Christians, why not use their language? Because the writer of the Quran had never read the Bible, that's why. Wasn't aware of these things, that's why. He wants to assume this, but in a debate, you have to prove it, not just assert it. So where are the Quranic texts that demonstrate an accurate knowledge of the doctrine of the Trinity? I haven't found it. We haven't heard it yet. And now both of us are getting to have you had 45 minutes worth of your time. Now, he went to John chapter 17, but again, he read a small portion. And that's always what happens. Yes, Jesus referred to the Father as the only true God. How else could it be? We're monotheists. Jesus has become incarnate. He has entered into human flesh. Look at the Carmen Christi, Philippians 2, 5-11. It is an early hymn of the Christian church. Probably from within the first decade of the Christian church, they're singing hymns to Christ as God. And what does Philippians 2, 5-11 tell us? It tells us that Christ did not consider the equality he had with the Father something to be held onto at all costs. But he laid that equality aside, voluntarily made himself of no reputation, became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. And because of that, God the Father highly exalted him and gave him a name which is above every name, that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, every tongue should confess, all the glory of God the Father. That was the primitive belief of the Christians. That's not something that Constantine came up with. That is a hymn of the early church. And here in John chapter 17, he stopped before he should have, because he did mention, of course, the fact that Jesus says there's only one true God. You know, there, there is only one true God. But then, what else did he say? Have you ever read beyond that, those of you who use this text? Did you ever go into verses 4 and following? Listen to what it says. I glorify you on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. Now listen to this. My friends, my Muslim friends... Look me in the eye and tell me that a Razul or a prophet could ever say these words. And now, Father, glorify me at your side with the glory I had with you before the world was created. Moses ever said 
Did David ever say that? Did Abraham ever say that? Jesus says, glorify me. What does the book of Isaiah say? Glory only belongs to God. Only he is to be glorified. Only he is to be worshipped. Jesus says, glorify me at your side with the glory that I shared with you in eternity past. What prophet would ever say those words? That is why the standard approach to these issues in modernism is to deny that Jesus ever said these things by alleging corruption of the biblical text. But isn't it interesting? Adnan hasn't said anything about corruption in the biblical text this evening. He's quoted a number of texts. If they have come down to us accurately, and they're in the very same papyri manuscripts of the second century that all the rest of this is in, then Jesus said these words, and you need to explain to me. What did Jesus mean? How could Jesus say this? How could verse 3 even say that the eternal life is to know two persons? Can you imagine what Moses is saying? This is eternal life that you know Moses. No, we instinctively know that no mere creature, no mere human being can say those words. But Jesus says them. Jesus says they go, I need I am. Remember in the garden when the soldiers were coming to take Jesus? He says, who are you seeking? They say, Jesus and Nazareth. And Jesus says, Ego I mean. The Gospel of John tells us they fell back upon the ground. Why do soldiers fall back upon the ground? When someone simply says, I am. The Gospel of John tells us. That's why when Jesus rises from the dead, Thomas the Apostle. When Jesus invites him to touch him, to see that it is truly him, the Spirit has not flesh and bones to see me out. Thomas doesn't even have to. Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Now, if Jesus was just an apostle, if Jesus is just a result of the law, and someone bows down before you and says, My Lord and my God, what is your duty? Don't do that. When people try to bow down and worship the apostles, what do they say? Don't do that. Worship only God. When John tried to bow down and worship the angels, book Revelation, what does he do? Don't do that. Worship only God. Thomas bows down before Jesus and says, My Lord and my God. And Thomas says, Because you've seen me and you believe, blessed are those who have not seen him yet believe. He saw his faith. Is that what a mere of the school does? Yes, the New Testament the testimony is very clear. Paul identifies him as our Lord and God in 2 Peter 1, 1, Isaiah 2, 13. Our Lord and our God, the very same language of nations would use in AD 108. Constantine had nothing to do with such things. Nothing. He describes our Lord and our God. He describes the creator of all things. When Paul wrote to the Colossians, who were beginning to be infected by proto-Gnosticism. He described Jesus Christ. He said, For by Him were all things made, whether in heaven or in earth, visible or invisible, in principalities, powers, thrones, and beings. All things were created by Him and for Him. He is before all things, and in Him all things consist or hold together. That means, my friends, that as you sit here this evening, you're borrowing His air. Every beat of your heart, every breath you take, comes from His hand. That's why you can't be neutral about who Jesus Christ is. That's the testimony of the New Testament. That's the consistent testimony of the New Testament. From Matthew to Revelation, He's Lord, Kudios, the very word used for Yahweh in the Greek Septuagint. He's the Lord of the Sabbath. He's the Son of Man from the book of Daniel, who is worshipped by his followers, the Ancient One. He's the creator of all things. He's worshipped, and he accepts the worship of those who bow down before him. So, tonight's debate is not supposed to be on that opportunity. But I've not spent most of his time addressing that particular issue. Alright? I'd be glad to respond. 
because the main question of tonight's debate has yet to be answered. We know what the doctrine of Trinity is. It starts with the assertion of the Shema, Shema Yisrael, Yahweh Elohim, and Yahweh Echad. One God, Echad, the very same term that you have in, in Surah 112. Is it not? Yes. That's where we start. But we recognize that God's being is so infinite, so unlimited, that it can, in divine revelation, be shared by three divine persons, Father, Son, and Spirit. We associate no one with the being of God. We do not divide our worship. The simple fact of the matter is the scriptures that existed, that your own Quran says were not solved, they were sent down by God. Those scriptures which the author of the Quran does not seem to show any familiarity with taught these things long before Muhammad came along. And I say to you, the Quran has not been shown this evening to accurately identify the doctrine of the Trinity. And if you want to say, well, when it says three, uh, you know, even though it says three elsewhere, and you have a law, Mary, and Jesus, and sort of five, that's not really the Trinity, he's not talking about that. Okay, fine. Tell us who that's talking about, first of all. What, what religious group was that talking about? And then secondly, show us where in the Quran, the doctrine of the Trinity, which distinguishes between being and person, and that was known hundreds of years before him, is stated and condemned. Where is it? Once we've been able to do that, then the debate will be closed. Thank you very much.